Hello, welcome to the program, Innovations in Orthopedic Solutions, Evaluating the Use of Decellularized Dermal Allografts in Improving Patient Outcomes. This program is supported by an educational grant from TRX Biosurgery and provided by North American Center for Continuing Medical Education, LLC, and HMP program. My name is Dr. Vitas Ringus, and I'm a foot and ankle specialist uh, who's an orthopedic surgeon in Norman, Oklahoma. Uh, I'm the medical director for the uh, Tier 2 Women's Soccer WPSL League and take care of multiple soccer teams in the region. I'm joined by Dr. Robert Hines, who is an orthopedic and sports medicine uh, specialist in shoulder and knee. He is the chief of surgery at Community North Hospital, head wrestling physician for the University of Oklahoma, an Olympic team physician in 2008 and 2012, who currently practices in Oklahoma City. Uh, t today's learning objectives include evaluate the emerging data on the use of biologics in orthopedic applications, r including rotator cuff and foot and ankle repairs, examine the biomechanical properties of intact acellular matrix and potential impact on surgical outcomes, investigate via case studies clinical outcomes surrounding reduction in pain, the use of narcotics when using intact extracellular matrix versus other treatment options, view cases, expected clinical outcomes, and return to activity when biologics an intact extracellular matrix and low residual DNA are used. So, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Hines and let's get started. Good morning. Uh, my, uh, uh, my main focus today will be on uh, the rotator cuff repairs. Um, first of all, uh, we have to consider that the rotator cuff tear is a disease tendon. Uh, there's uh, evidence of collagen degeneration, disordered arrangement. Uh, significant decreased vascularity, as well as a decreased hemocytes and fibroblasts. Uh, and the reported literature from uh, Fuchs uh, Journal of Joint, Bone and Joint Surgery 2006, their reported retear rate uh, after open rotator cuff repair, single tendon of 13%, massive tears of 34%, which is, which is, which is concerningly high. But the problem in practicing orthopedic surgeons is that the problem with the persistent pain postoperatively, and that's combined with uh, obviously the narcotic epidemic we have in the United States, and at least in Oklahoma, we have new narcotic prescription laws which limit the, the operative surgeon on prescribing uh, pain medicines uh, postoperatively. So, so, um, uh, the goal of rotator cuff surgery, in my mind, is number one, and as, as I tell my patients, to stop the pain. Number two, to stop the pain, and three, to stop the pain. We, we want to stop the pain. That's why they're having surgery. Number two, the t we want to heal the tendon, okay? And then we want to uh, obviously decrease the re-tear rate and then ultimately return uh, the, uh, the patient to full maximum function. So, so how how can we strengthen our repairs? How can we how, how can we do that? Well, there's a lot of different ways we can do that, and there's a lot, been a lot of literature on single and double row repairs. There's there's, there's a lot of a lot of literature on that, a lot of uh, controversial literature uh, in terms of which is better, single row, double row. Uh, also, um, uh, there's been re reports on using a uh, a augmentation of uh, using. A, a dermal allograft, and they've done some studies looking at ultimate failure of single row repairs, uh, being uh, uh, in one study uh, 273 newtons, whereas uh, we're using the a dermal allograft, the the repair is stronger at almost 325 newtons. So uh, this was done by Barber in the Journal of Arthroscopy in 2008. So and also there's been uh, some prospective randomized. Uh, uh, studies looking at acellular human dermal matrix augmentations for arthroscopic rot rotator cuff repairs, and they found that uh, with augmentation, they obviously have a, a lower rate of repair uh, at 15% with augmentation, and without augmentation, uh, uh, the repair rate is, 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 is concerningly high at uh, almost uh, 60%. So, I use a uh, uh, decellularized dermal allograft, what I call a rotator cuff tears at risk, and and uh, I consider rotator cuff tears at risk large, massive rotator cuff tears, usually two two to three tendon rotator cuff tears, and then I also 
compromise, which we see quite commonly, thin, delaminated tears, uh, and sometimes in older uh, patient populations, the rotator cuff, te- rotator cuff tendon is quite thin. And we've seen uh, quite frequently when, when rotator cuff tears are repaired with thin tendons, there is a higher risk of retearing. And then also uh, uh, another indication in terms of my practice is with doing, and I feel uh, quite a few revisions that I have to do, uh, revision rotator cuff tears are rotator cuff tears at risk. So, but um, not all um, surgical augmentation uh, graphs are, are created equal. Uh, you have to consider a, a couple of different uh, parameters. Number one is the graph take. Uh, we have to have revascularization. I consider uh, the, the, the graph needs to have uh, has to signal cellular migration and proliferation. Uh, we also want to have a early graph integration. In the, in the graphs that I use, uh, it uh, demonstrates proangiogenic response and adheres within seven days, which is important. You want the graph to adhere quickly uh, because motion, we're going to have to start motion early uh, to prevent any type of stiffness. And also another important parameter is we have to, the, the graph handling has to be good. The, it, what I call suturability. The graph needs to be thin enough to not provide, uh, not to have crowding in the subacromial space, but it also has to be biomechanically strong to allow sutures to be placed within this uh, decellularized dermal allograft to hold the suture. Uh, and so when it's, uh, in, when it's uh, fixed, uh, on top of the rotator cuff pair at, at strength and, uh, and with biomechanical strength, uh, it holds the suture. Uh, again, it's easy to place the suture through, and it, uh, and it also is thin to minimize crowding in the subacromial space. So the Dermapure, which is a decellularized dermal allograph that, uh, that I have been using, uh, uh, the biomechanical performances are superior to uh, some of the uh, uh, commercially available market leaders. Looking at the Dermapure, and the Dermapure is, is about a millimeter in, in, uh, in thickness, and the ultimate tensile strength, tensile maximal load, all the parameters of biomechanical testing are, are almost at the area of market leaders that are twice as thick. So the, the Dermapure adds as a uh, thin, very strong biomechanical uh, structure that uh, that you can use to augment, uh, that I use to use, augment uh, my rotator cuff repairs in what I call rotator cuff tears at risk. So, first case is uh, uh, that I'm going to show today is a, uh, uh, and these are all rot- these are rotator cuff tears. A uh, 68-year-old attorney, uh, also is a professional roper who who uh, was uh, thrown from his horse, landed on the shoulder. Uh, he went to see the surgeon. Uh, he told him he didn't want really anything done. So they, the surgeon uh, j- just started him on um, started him on the rehab program. Um, it was his dominant shoulder. He complained of night pain, loss of motion, uh, significant weakness. I saw him at two months postoperatively. Um, at that time, he did have full range of motion. He had significant weakness, a uh, four or five in the spine. In, uh, in the subscapular, supraspinatus, infraspinatus tendons, uh, and his rotator in his uh, MR arthrogram showed uh, uh, full thickness, full thickness retracted tears of the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, as well as the subscapularis, with no uh, atrophy of the muscles. So, first first uh, uh, slide here is, is this the significant the significantly torn retracted full thickness rotator cuff tear you can see under surface delamination and and significant retraction but again there was no uh, uh, fatty infiltration uh, significant fatty infiltration on this MR arthrogram another view posteriorly you can see where this was significantly retracted for the footprint there's some delamination some degeneration from the tendon so obviously a, a, a rotator cuff tear at risk uh, both delaminated large retracted massive tear so um, what we did took him to the operating room he had an underwent an arthroscopy subacromial decompression distal clavicle excision uh, 
and then I do my rotator cuff repairs through a deltoid splitting incision, uh, especially at rotator cuff tears at risk if I'm going to use a dermal uh, uh, a dermal allograft. So this is the rotator cuff tear after it's been fixed. The, the, the medial sutures, which you see, which is a permacord and permatape from, uh, uh, from the anchors that I use, are, are, are there. And, and uh, so I size the, the uh, graph, the, the graph size from the anchor to the posterior uh, anchors. Uh, and then uh, I use a decellulized dermal allograft, de de deglycerinized it. I soak it in bacitracin, vancomycin, and then they put it on. Uh, uh, put it on the table, you know, and then we, uh, I, I put the medial anchors and I thread them through uh, the medial aspect of the uh, graft, and then I uh, use a suture bridge technique uh, and secure that over the repair, so we're getting the double row repair, uh, the graft is incorporated into the rotator cuff repair, uh, and it's very secure, uh, it's secure fixation. So this patient, uh, and this is the main, this is one of the main uh, uh, benefits I see of using dermal allograft augmentation. Every person that I've done, 99% of them are off all narcotics four to five days post-operatively. Off all narcotics at four to day, four to four days four to five days post-operatively. Uh, my protocol uh, with using the decellularized dermal allograft uh, incorporated into a rotator cuff there. I I, uh, I keep them mobilized in in a sling for sort of six weeks. I do not start passive motion till three weeks post operatively. Really, let the dermal allograft adhere to the rotator cuff tear. And what I've found is that with having no pain, these patients do not get sick. Okay, and so uh, I usually um, start passive motion three weeks post operatively out of the sling just for activities of daily living at the six week post op bar. This patient had full range of motion, okay? And then the six-week six week mark is when I start on a rotator cuff thoracic strengthening program. Uh, the patient did fantastic. And at six months post op he went back to professional roping. Uh, the biggest thing with, with, this, with these patients that I use for the decelerized, they stop hurting. I do not have a problem with pain. Uh, there's such a high incidence of patients that have rotator cuff repair continue to hurt. Using That's the, one of the most impressive things about using this is that these patients stop hurting and start, are off narcotics within the first week, which is, I think is, is, is impressive. So second case, another a rotator, I don't write another rotator cuff, 44-year-old SWAT officer, very fit, very muscular officer, uh, right hand dominant, fell off felt dislocated his shoulder, okay? Uh, he, he, was go he went through the work comp mill delay, um, and so uh, I saw him at eight weeks post-operatively. Uh, his, his main complaints, night pain, pain that wake him from sleep every night, loss of motion, inability to hold a weapon to the SWAT officer. Uh, in the examination, zero to nine degrees of motion, full passive motion, severe weakness at three plus over five, had no instability. Uh, his MRI, MR, MRR gram showed a massive rotator cuff tear of both the supraspinatus and infraspinatus tendons with attraction to the mid humeral head, no fatty atrophy uh, on his MRR gram. So, again, a significantly retracted rotator cuff tear. Uh, not too much delamination, it's a degeneration on the articular surface, two tendon tear. Again, this is a this is a posterior view. Again, significant retractions, mid mid humeral head level, and so he underwent same an arthroscopy, arthroscopic subacromial decompression, distal clavicle excision, and then through a deltoid splitting incision, he had the rotator cuff repaired, okay, double row repair, and then it was on the pr prior case, he had the the, the dermal allograft incorporated to the medial medial row sutures. And then using the double row repair, uh, he had the uh, dermal allograft secured on uh, uh, securely onto the rotator cuff. So again, this patient, I mean, and, and, and this is a narcotic. I mean, a, a officer. He, I mean, they they're they're tested all the time, even if they're on. So he was off narcotics two days postoperatively. Uh, he had uh, uh, pass, uh, we started passive mode, same protocol, three weeks postoperatively, 
Again, no problem getting all those motions back. Out of the sling of six weeks for activities a day living, his range of motion was full. Again, he had no pain. I think a pain is the, all the pain people have with rotator cuff repair is a significant risk factor in stiffness. So we started strengthening six weeks post Again, his range of motion was full. He returned to full activities as a SWAT officer at the six month post op mark. And they have to go through intensive return to work physical. So it allowed them to climb ropes and, and things of that nature. So he, he passed that with flying colors. So, so why, why do I augment with it with dermat pure decellularized dermalograph? Well, the, the problem is, is that rotator cuffs are hard to heal. They have persistent pain and they are, then they have a high retear rate. So uh, the derm pure it, it adheres within seven days, high tensile strength, low profile, no crowding within the subacromal space. And again, it adds structural strength to the repair, stops the pain very quickly. And again, these people, I mean, 99% of the people that I do with the, when I augment them, they are off all narcotics within a week. And I think that's important. It's a very important part. And I think that the main reason it seals it and improves the healing environment underneath the, uh, uh, underneath the rotator cuff, it's kind of like a seal. And I think it eventually improves improves the function. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Um, I'll follow up with my part on the foot and ankle, and I will. You'll find that I echo a lot of what Dr. Hines uh, mentioned. I think I think some of the concepts and principles are, are the same in the foot and ankle. Obviously, it's a slightly different uh, organ and body part, and we have different uh, criteria or requirements. And so I think that um, it'll be interesting for me to relay how this uh, applies to my practice. Uh, as a foot and ankle specialist. So dermal allografts really are a, a newer product that uh, consists of uh, patented processing techniques that leave variable residual uh, yield of DNA. And that's important because it decreases the risk of uh, some, a graft post reaction or some sort of inflammatory process that could weaken or um, affect the structure of the actual graft itself. They have strong load characteristics uh, that are important in the foot and as the shoulders we heard before, there are multiple sizes available. They rehydrate quickly, which is um, important when it comes to um, operative time. Uh, we, don't, we don't sit around for these things to, to get functional. Um, they're easy to use surgically. Uh, again, Dr. Hines mentioned this, and again, I will second it, that the handling techniques are, uh, I think, superior to some of the other products on the market. And they're available through uh, select distributors and buying groups. So they're, they're, they're pretty, pretty, pretty reasonably attainable. Uh, I don't think this is some specialty product that you always have to um, call in somebody uh, unique for. So I like that. So graft incorporation, based on a study by Bertazzi, includes um, a biologic human acellular dermal matrix that we use in the Achilles tendon repair. Um, they were studied uh, and biopsied, and uh, they were found to be uh, uh, successful in a variety of procedures, including sports medicine-related wound repair and breast reconstructions, um, in terms of incorporation. Now, we weren't we didn't fully understand the process, but over time, I think that's been fleshed out. Uh, and in this specific case study, uh, they looked at uh, a patient who uh, had a rupture, re-rupture of the native tendon uh, that occurred two months after undergoing uh, an Achilles tendon repair using matricel uh, treated um, acellular dermal uh, graft. Um, the ADM was removed, and extensive histology analysis was performed on the tissue itself that showed uh, ingrowth. Additionally, uh, the liter literature, was re literature review was conducted uh, to determine the mechanism of this integration in the tendon and uh, to explore if differences in the mechanism existed for different types of human ADMs. Ultimately, what they identified was that the histology analysis demonstrated that the healing process uh, during a tendon reconstruction is similar to that of uh, a wound healing. Uh, namely, there is a proangiogenic response with uh, incorporation and gradual conversion to the appropriate type of uh, human collagen required. Uh, the literature review that they conducted also showed that differences exist in the mechanism for integration among the various human uh, ADMs, and these may be d due to variances in the methods and technology uh, that produces the ADMs, namely the, the cleansing and scrubbing process to give you a, less, a lower DNA yield in the actual uh, graft itself. So dermal allografts underwent a histologic evaluation um, via uh, a biopsy for an Achilles tendon augmentation for the graft jacket matrix. Uh, they hit, hit, 
from, this was done by Leiden in the Journal of American Podiatric Medicine. They histologically evaluated a six-month biopsy sample from an Achilles tendon tear, augmented with uh, graft jacket as mentioned above. Uh, she initially was treated for Hagenhoff deformity, uh, and they used the allograft matrix to augment the primary pair of the tendon. This hardware, which they used to fixate the uh, calcaneus, was then removed, and a biopsy was performed. It underwent specific staining, including hematoxylin and eosin, uh, Movat, pentachrome, and toluidine blue stains. Uh, as an aside, my father's a pathologist, so he, he may understand that better than me. Um, but suffice it to say, I think they're specific for uh, tendon incorporation. Visually, that is grossly, the graft appeared normal and incorporated with the native tendon. No repeat tear was observed, and the results of uh, tests for infection were negative. Historically, the graft was infiltrated predominantly with fibroblasts and demonstrated numerous blood vessels um, and positive proteoglycan staining in the um, graft and at sites of vascularity indicated probable transformation to tendon-like tissue. So their conclusions from this biopsy were that the um, dermal allograft is highly compatible, supports revascularization and repopulation with uh, non-inflammatory cells, and becomes incorporated by the surrounding host tissue, which, uh, as Dr. Hines has, has already mentioned, and I will again echo, that's uh, critically important when you're reconstructing tendons under significant tension particularly when we're trying to get patients back to activity potentially quicker and with less pain. Um, and I will show a case study here coming up where we use the Achilles as well, as I feel that fits in my practice pretty well. So after we've just seen that two uh, case studies were performed where they took biopsies of the acellular human dermal allograft uh, matrix and looked for incorporation, they then performed a case series whereupon they explored nine patients who underwent Achilles tendon repair with an acellular dermal matrix. Um, the functional outcomes were evaluated using the foot uh, function index, revised long form, and clinical results were forwarded. This was presented by Cole in the journal Foot and Ankle Surgery. And after mean average follow-up of 14.4 uh, months, the mean uh, foot function index revised score was 33%, uh, and no cases of re or complication that required additional treatment occurred during the observation period. So long story short, patients did quite well. Their pain improved. Uh, and if evaluating a series of these nine uh, patients, it seems that this is a reproducible effect that the two biopsies previously showed via, via incorporations of the native tendon structure. So our, inf our understanding of this is growing. Our data collection is improving. And we're starting to see that this is something that we can uh, reliably produce over and over in the foot and ankle. So a little background on some of these. Alloderm is a graft jacket dermal graft that was launched in 1999. Rehydration time is roughly 10 to 40 minutes. Not much available on the actual processing technique that I could find. Um, available through buying groups, reasonable cost, and multiple size available. I'm familiar with graft jacket. It's uh, one of the products I uh, use as well. Uh, it has been around a long time, um, and it's something that I think most surgeons are familiar with. Um, it is a human dermal, human dermal allograft that undergoes proprietary processing, as mentioned above. I couldn't find much information about it. To allow the residual components to remain in their natural state, it's recognized as human tissue. It is revascularizing, remodeling, and transitioning into host tissue per right medical. Dermapure is another dermal graft I use, probably one I'm more comfortable and familiar with. Uh, this is a complicated slide uh, that talks uh, significantly about um, what d technology is, specifically a proprietary technique used to cleanse the native tissue or the allograft tissue of uh, DNA components and or other uh, native proteins that may ultimately, as mentioned above, affect incorporation uh, and integrity of the graft uh, that ultimately may lead to better outcomes. Uh, it, is, it goes through a series of washes um, that, again, are proprietary that in this study here, or sorry, in this slide here, shows you the residual uh, DNA identified in, uh, graft in, in Dermapure and its competitors. Um, I think that this is interesting to know because, again, as a graft jacket user and Dermapure user, um, there, is a, there is a significant difference in the dry weight uh, after an analysis is done. I can't speak specifically for Arthroflex, but uh, in terms of my understanding of these products, I think that's uh, somewhat in interesting to compare uh, the outcomes. So this sort of summarizes uh, the three uh, products that we most commonly see in this field, um, uh, the Graft Jacket, Dermapure, and Arthroflex. Um, it, it discusses what
the product is, is what remains, and what their differences are. Um, Dermapure, I think, currently, in terms of the market, seems to do the best job removing, um, as I mentioned above, the extraneous uh, nuclear products as well as proteins. The other products mentioned to the right have some of those characteristics, but certainly don't carry them all over. Now, obviously, we don't know that specifically uh, regarding uh, graft jacket as you see here, but uh, I assume that um, it probably goes through some testing. So indications in my practice specifically include soft tissue defects, whereupon it acts as a bridge, which Dr. Hines elucidated on, loss of tissue integrity, which um, you can potentially link to delamination in the rotator cuff, but in the foot and ankle, this is something that we would see in, for example, a perineal tendon that we have a case we'll present. You can see this in Achilles tendons uh, as they are long tendons that undergo quite a bit of shear. Um, sometimes in, in relatively avascular areas, one of the things that we continue to expound upon are, is the proangiogenic features of this acellular human dermal allograft, whereby, uh, and specifically in, in the dermapure process, Pro-K2, comes in and uses the uh, small holes or channels in the actual graft itself to uh, act as vascular ingrowth pathways that I think uh, other grafts don't have. So would this be a consideration for relative avascular area? In my mind, uh, it probably is. I think that this is one of those instances where we can use your own biology uh, and augment it and allow for increased penetration, growth, and transformation out of, of a native tendon that, as mentioned above, may not have um, uh, sufficient or, or at least optimal blood supply to heal by itself. And then lastly, are they used for primary or revision procedures? I think uh, it, th these grafts are suitable for both. I think that, it, again, it depends on what the procedure is, how much support is needed, what sort of uh, tendon characteristics are identified. And so when I go into many of my foot and ankle cases that require some sort of augmentation, I, I go through this checklist of is there a defect, is there integrity loss, is it a avascular, and then I don't really care if it's revision, primary or revision. If it's indicated, um, it's indicated. So a couple case studies. For me, the first one, this is a 20-year-old female, uh, active. She's had two years of anterior knee pain. She's failed therapy, bracing, anti-inflammatories, and steroids. The MRI showed patellar tendinosis. We attempted PRP in an effort to stimulate uh, healing. This is sort of a microchephrenation procedure in addition to the PRP to try to get some angiogenesis. Um, and after uh, failing this and having a long discussion with her, I, I, I told her I couldn't really uh, point to great studies regarding uh, dermapure augmentation or a human uh, dermal augmentation in, in the literature, but I feel that uh, in this case, uh, a patellar tendon would be a reasonable option. I think it would add um, tensile strength. It would uh, allow for increased uh, tissue presence and act as a scaffold, both for bulking as well as for androgenic um, uh, proliferation. So we performed this with her. We, we proceeded with the surgery. We debrided it and placed the allograft uh, onto the proximal uh, patellar tendon. Uh, and four months out, she is, was essentially no pain and returned to full activity and was really pleased with the ultimate uh, outcome. These are some pre-op uh, images. You can see that uh, near the insertion on the left and the right that she's got some uh, inflammation and, and the tendon appears to have uh, uh, some uh, signal change. And if we look at it postoperatively, the tendon itself appears to be more normal. It's hard to see here, but there seems to be continuity of the tendon, uh, both on the left and the right, uh, with better attachment to the uh, uh, patella itself. Um, and I'm ultimately pleased with the amount, with the lack actually, of uh, residual edema she had, suggesting to me that this would this was almost completely fully healed at four months, which um, I was uh, pleased with. Case two is more my bread and butter. Case two is a 66-year-old uh, female who had left-sided heel pain for over a year. Uh, we diagnosed her with um, really Achilles tendinosis with a Hagler deformity. She had, she had attempted conservative treatment options, boot, physical therapy, anti-inflammatories. I traditionally, and I think most orthopedic surgeons, don't inject Achilles tendons anymore with steroid for risk of rupture, and we certainly didn't want to cause that in her. Uh, we did discuss platelet-rich plasma, which she ultimately deferred on. So after undergoing an MRI, which showed a Haglund's, 
with moderate and moderate to severe hypertrophy, tendinopathy, and interstitial tearing. We had to have a discussion with her regarding what her options would be. There is some literature that points to the amount of tendon involvement uh, being related to the success of conservative care. 50% is the number thrown around a lot. That traditionally was seen in non-insertional Achilles tendinopathy, which is an avascular area. This is insertional Achilles tendinopathy, but it's still a number I use in my patients to give them a sense of, is there a chance of, of spontaneous rupture? What are the results of, you know, what are the chances of conservative healing? In her case, she had gone through all of that, uh, and at this point, we felt that the final option was surgery. So uh, I discussed with the patient that uh, we could go ahead and proceed with this, do a debridement, and augment this with, uh, with a graft jacket. Uh, I felt that uh, this is one of those cases where once you clean out the Achilles tendon, if it has enough inflammation, as I mentioned above, and eliminate the Hagelin's deformity, you debride the tendon to the level uh, that it's difficult to imagine it will heal. It really gets, um, it gets resected. And even though we do an intraoperative Thompson test to assess uh, integrity, there's still some concern that after uh, removing the diseased tendon, there just isn't enough uh, to give adequate strength or recover over time. And so um, if you do a complete resection, a lot of, of the diseased tendon, as mentioned, I will oftentimes consider augmentation. This is one of those places, and at this time, I use a graft jacket. So the patient was... this. The patient at the time was discharged home. She was non-weight-bearing for four weeks, followed by physical therapy and weight-bearing in a boot. I will say that when I started my practice eight or nine years ago, I routinely do these cases and not add augmentation, have the patient remain non-weight-bearing for at least six weeks before transitioning him into a boot. Over time, as my understanding of, of, of grafting and augmentation has improved, namely the last two to three years, I've, I've started to accelerate, accelerate the rehabilitation protocol such that if I'm able to restore integrity, tensile strength with either an onlay or an inlay technique, depending on whether this is a non-insertional or non-insertional tear, respectively, that with patient pain and decrease in pain, decrease in swelling, and accelerated healing rates, I feel I could start walking them in a boot at four weeks. And to date, that has proven, at least anecdotally, uh, in my case series in my mind, to be to be true. So she follows the same pattern as, as the other patients. However, Unlike the other patients, she continues to complain of pain and swelling. She failed physical therapy, uh, and she, she failed other non-operative management. So we went back to the drawing board. Anti-inflammatories, rest, immobilization. Again, we touched on PRP. She deferred on that again. We regained range of motion and achieved 4 plus of 5 strength. However, six months later, she's still unhappy. She has localized swelling, pain. Her quality of life is affected, and we're concerned. So we repeat an MRI. This shows severe hypertrophic tendinopathy with a four-centimeter ill-defined tear with a full thickness component filled with inflammatory tissue, but no gap. So looking at this, has the disease tendon ever healed? Are we looking at the uh, uh, graft jacket? It's a little difficult to, to sort out. Ultimately, having a discussion with the patient, we proceeded um, with, with the repeat exploration, uh, and ultimately through an extended similar incision, we went uh, through the Achilles, identified the residual graft jacket, uh, debrided it, performed another extensive resection, what was left, uh, and then um, this time Im implanted again through an onlay technique. You can see here uh, the Dermapure decelerated dermal allograft. Um, this was placed uh, somewhat circumferentially, so I'll, instead of an onlay, we'll call it a wraparound. Maybe we'll call it a wraparound. And so we laid some of it down. Uh, immediately, and then laterally wrapped it around and reincorporated into a, a, side, a direct side to side repair of the Achilles uh, and proceeded uh, to follow the same post operative protocol uh, because I felt that at this time that she would have similar results. And severance relief, she did. So at four weeks, she was transitioned out of a, out of a splint and cast into a boot, began to weight bear. She was off narcotics relatively soon, actually, three or four weeks after surgery, which is surprising considering it's a revision. Her swelling, her pain, and her range of motion all improved. Uh, I, I just saw her actually for her final follow-up roughly six weeks ago. Um, she had nearly full return of function, just a, a little residual stiffness, which is not uncommon in, in revision surgeries, no pain, mineral swelling, and return to all activities. Uh, she was actually excited that she could spend Easter with her family. So um, it's interesting that uh, one one allograft worked, one didn't. I, you know, I, I attribute it to uh, potentially um, better proangiogenic features, um, maybe maybe less nuclear content. I, I don't know. Um, again, I'm, I use both products, and, and I think results are, are, are good in many instances for both. So um, third study, um, and this is a little different. This is another revision, right? So we talk about primary versus revision, and I don't, I don't really differentiate much except for the characteristic of the tear. 
But in this patient, she's a uh, 54-year-old female who's had two previous perineal tendon repairs. Uh, she had a neuroma uh, from a probably superficial perineal nerve scarring or injury that was inadvertent. Um, she had uh, revealed increased pain with resisted inversion, eversion, localized swelling, decreased strength at four or five, uh, but no real restriction range of motion and no subluxation of the tendons. So she has tendons, the, the perineal tendons, that are significantly painful. They're not subluxing. At all. You know, she has likely a, a, a post-operative neuroma, uh, but it's just an excruciating pain. So in order to get a roadmap, we repeat the MRI. We identify significant scarring and, rec- and a recurrent perineal brevis there. At this point, this would be a third surgery, and so I'm starting to worry about not only the, the vascularity of the tendon from the multiple incisions, but also the uh, girth or, or width of the tendon. There's only so much you can debride. So we had a discussion with her regarding what her options would be. Um, we talked about excising the aroma and then advancing and exploring the tendons. Um, Dr. Hines mentioned something uh, that I think is uh, very important, that there is a side of the graft that sticks pretty quickly. Uh, which is important because the tendon, the particular perineal tendon, is going to slide around a groove, and you don't want this graft displacing. So the other side of the graft, though, has, I, I believe, and less uh, sticky properties, so you get some gliding. So you want to wrap this around almost like a, like a neural wrap, but it's not. Um, it's a tendon wrap. Uh, my <laughs> In fellowship, my attendant used to call it a, almost a prosciutto sandwich. So one side was salty, one side was not. I, it's kind of weird. But um, we ultimately elected to proceed with that, and after exploration, we identified that there was a large retrofibular tear of the brevis, and it was delaminated and thin, and I mean, it looked almost like a stretched out Tootsie Roll. So I thought this was a perfect indication to use, in this case, a dermapure graft. We wrapped the dermal side uh, on the graft and the, and the posterior side on the outside so they could slide but get the stickiness and hopefully incru- improve um, uh, both vascular growth as well as uh, tendon growth itself to bulk up the tendon. Uh, we uh, debrided both tendons uh, and uh, ultimately proceeded with uh, laying it on. And this is a, a good picture. If you look at figure two, the tendon located, uh, the, the white strip located posteriorly uh, that looks like a piece of string cheese is actually parent's longest. The brevis is located directly in the fibular groove there. We can see that it's, it's a relatively long graft because we want to span the distance of uh, the brevis that is rubbing against the back of the fibula. We uh, wrap the uh, ingrow side along around the um, perineus brevis and tie it to itself as well as running it through the brevis like a prosciutto sandwich. And this latter approach is pretty typically what I perform. I ultimately explore proximally, identify the neuroma, excised it, uh, and uh, subsequently uh, I got a good repair on it. Uh, I palpated the retrofibular groove. I thought it was appropriately deep. I did not feel that um, I needed to further deepen this. And ultimately, as in my cases, I go ahead and imbricate the superior perineal retinaculum to prevent further subluxation. Postoperatively, she's a little tough for recovery. Uh, because of the, of the patient's neuroma, uh, she, she required some more postoperative narcotics, which gradually we, we weaned her off of. Some of this was controlled with uh, nerve medication. Um, the neuromatous pain eventually resolved. She was made um, uh, non weight bearing for two weeks um, in, a spl- in a splint, and then I put her in a boot and let her start to graduate bearing and do physical therapy, again to regain motion. So this is a similar concept to the rotator cuff as well as to the Achilles, that we're trying to get motion back not only for uh, patient strength as well as uh, patient function, but also I think motion just naturally uh, restores uh, normal, fat, normal healing and, and um, uh, local factors that allow the tendon to ob- obtain a more normal shape and decrease scarring. I think that's been proven through multiple studies. Now, the question that in the, the perineal case is, are we increasing the risk of a re-tear, re-tear or subluxation? In her case, I did not find that to be so. So over at three weeks, she begins to start to weight bear in a boot. She starts physical therapy. By six weeks, she's still having some residual pain and stiffness. By, by three months after surgery, her pain has significantly improved. She's essentially off narcotics. Uh, the neuroma uh, has gone away, and her ankle range of motion and strength have returned. Um, she's pleased with the progress, still has some residual stiffness and pain over the scar, but I think that's related more to the multiple surgeries. I think overall, she's satisfied with her tendon function, and she's glad she had the surgery. So I think it's, it's interesting to compare... The acellular human human dermal matrix can work on both a tendon that requires a straight pull as a has augmented strength functioning, if that makes sense, uh, as well as uh, a tendon that requires uh, glide and motion uh, because of the ability to um, act to stick and then also to prevent adhe- adhesion formation in the right settings. Um, 
ultimately, I've been very happy with uh, switching to uh, uh, these type of graphs. So conclusions, um, in my practice, dermal allografts have been proven to be safe and effective. I think, as, as mentioned above, there were initially uh, biopsy studies that were evaluating the matrix, and then a case series, and then ultimately sort of phase four studies where surgeons like Dr. Hines and myself ultimately evaluated them in larger groups of patients. Uh, and some early data is coming out that shows it's effective and works, decreases pain, and potentially allows earlier re return to function. Um, I think it has improved handling qualities over some of the other tissue grafts. Uh, and I haven't mentioned um, uh, placental grafts, but sometimes the placental grafts are relatively flimsy. Uh, I think that uh, if you over-prepare the, uh, these allograft matrices, you can lose strength. Uh, and, and they tear through too easily or they stay too thick. So it's the difference between a pork rind and a wet tissue, right? And you want something in between. Again, I allude to what I mentioned just a slide ago, that, that those biomechanical properties allow it to act in multiple, in multiple capacities. One is both to augment strength and the second is to allow gliding. So um, uh, they are pro-angiogenic, which, which is a hot topic, but not something we see very often. Um, you definitely want to see an increase in angiogenic factors, uh, which uh, there are some interesting studies out there that, that show that as, as time advances, um, uh, particularly at the three- to four-week mark, there is significant vascular ingrowth and early healing, uh, and that's one reason why I proceeded to have my patients start walking at four weeks with the Achilles. Um, early adherence and incorporation, just mentioned that. Accelerate healing and return to activity, again, sort of kind of the, the issue there. Um, and they're likely here to stay. I, I think this is something that is not going anywhere. I think they are a, uh, they've been around a while, but I think the future is bright. Um, the question will come down to really, I think, processing um, and uh, outcomes. And so th that's kind of where we are now. Uh, as mentioned before, I, this is something I discuss with my patients, even on primary cases and uh, especially in revisions. Uh, but my, uh, I feel that uh, these graphs are an important part of any um, orthopedic surgeon that treats tendinopathy, uh, tendinopathy is armamentarium. So hope that answers some questions. Hope it gives you some insight. Thank you. I think what everyone wants to know is when do we use this stuff? When? What are the indications? I think, I, I think uh, Dr. Ringus hit it very nicely, and I, I, the, I think the indications. What people want to know: when do I use it? When do I use it? And how do I use it? I mean, do when I do it? You know, can I do it through a deltoid split? Can I do it arthroscopically? The, the 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 problem with people using it is it just takes a little extra time. Uh, but the, the most important thing is is getting good results. Uh, and for me, if I have a rotator cuff tear at risk, which is a highly delaminated, very thin tear, and a lot of these people that we're doing, they're they're man, they're 50, 60, 70, sometimes 80 years old. I mean, the tissue is not good. So the I think if people um, if they're wondering when to use it, they should use it when they have any doubt of that the repair is going to be uh, durable. And that's why I use the rotator cuff tear at risk. Rotator cuff tears that, that are big, and those are the kind that tend to re-tear. Uh, rotator cuff tears that uh, are thin, delaminated, and then always the revision tears. And I think Dr. Ringus did it very good in terms of what his indications are, which are, and which are important. Dr. Ryan, I have a question. Um, maybe maybe some of you can answer. You, you mentioned um, emulsifying these in bacitracin and vancomycin. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly what two was. Um, what's well, your thought what process? I, what, I do, what I do, I mean, because the, the derm pure heat needs to be, de de I mean, you know, it has to be deglycerinized. I deglycerinize it. And it's just okay. basically just kind of rubbing it and saline. And then, and like for all my ACL reconstructions, the literature shows you soak your graft in vancomycin, uh, you have a decreased risk of infection. So, I mean, it's a, it's a big surgery. It's a decellularized dermal holograph. So I, I, so, I soak mine for about maybe, you know, two minutes in, in echomycin. I also, also add a little bit of bacitracin, which is my standard irrigating solution. And, and, and so you're adding your, you're adding your seal. You're adding your biomechanical reinforcement, but then also you're leaching vancomycin at the, at the wound level. And so, I mean, because I mean, these, these are bigger cases. So yeah. I have not had any infections in the patients that I've done, and these are these are big cases. Hmm. Hmm. 
have you had any issues, and we talk about indications in facilities. Now, do facilities sometimes balk at this because sometimes allografts aren't paid for? Um, have you had any problems with that? Yeah, we, uh, of course, we, are, we have a physician-owned hospital, uh, mm-hmm. and so there's a, we have an a implant, uh, implant committee that looks at cost containment of all of our implants, and so it was last brought up. Uh, it was last brought up at our last meeting. It says, "Hey, we our, our rotator cuff uh, repairs have the 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 the, uh, the cost has gone up." And so I said, "Well, th- that's on me because, it, and I've seen a more complex, uh, a higher volume of rotator cuff tears, more, lots more complex, high, uh, larger tears, uh, but but the." The ultimate goal is when, when they get down to cost, I, the, the most important thing is patient results. My right. patient results are superior when I use the dermal allograft. They're superior in terms of how they do. They do not hurt. They're off narcotics in five days. They, they do, since they don't hurt, they're not getting stiff. And the results are phenomenal. And, and and therefore it's bringing business back to us. So yeah, you add that a little bit of a you know, hey, let's 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 see why we're here. I mean, is it is it about cost? Yeah, but it's also about patient care and getting good results. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, one of the things that I sometimes cite some of the people that ask me questions regarding cost efficacy or or usage or indications is that is is that for I mean years, and I'm sure Dr. Ryan, you can echo this, but for years. I followed a very similar post for protocol, and I remember very specifically one of my attendings at Felsch was saying, don't walk them early, you're going to regret it. And so I didn't. And it required a, a, a paradigm shift or change in the way I thought about um, tendon healing in a corporation. This is what I think these dermal allografts provided. Uh, and so I, I, I thought, stepped outside of my comfort zone and said, let's see if this works. And I agree with you entirely that although the cost may be a little elevated, um, long term, I think the overall cost, that is it's cost efficacy versus time, is improved because they have less revision surgeries, they're off narcotics faster, which is healthy to patients and the society as a whole, their recovery is faster, and overall they come back and return to a higher level of function, at least for me, for my Achilles, because um, obviously you're dealing with complex rotator cuffs in 75-year-old, uh, 65-year-old men and women, but many of the people that come to see me, as you mentioned, the SWAT officer, are people who carry heavy loads, firemen, um, construction workers, oil field workers, who return have to return to a, a, a high basal level of function um, to to continue in their jobs, and and it could it was difficult. I mean, again, as I mentioned, you, you take away so much of the disease tendon that can they recover? Do they get strong enough? Um, and so I found that with dermal allografts, they do, and I, and 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 that ultimately I think drives not only a societal good but but drives a a, a uh, cost benefit um, to everybody because now these people have come back to work quicker. They're more uh, they're more effective at work, um, you know. And, I, and, I, and I, that's that's what I want to ask. I'm, I'm curious about that. I don't run into as much grief about it, um, but certainly I think that's on uh, maybe some of our listeners' minds. So, but concern nowadays, the, the, yeah. the, the concern of cost containment because of decreased reimbursement. You know, the people are concerned about, it, but they have to look at things that you talked about. Uh, you talked about, uh, as we both talked about, uh, less narcotic pain medication. Pe- people are off narcotics quicker. They, they're, they're doing better. They get back to work earlier. Uh, there's less revision surgery. And just, it's just, I mean, the cost-benefit ratio uh, uh, highly uh, favors the use of an augmentation device that decellulized dermal allograft with superior properties, rapid adherence, proangiogenic response. I mean, the cost cost benefit is obviously favors the use of an augmentation device. The big thing is like I mean, is is also with it. It does it take a little extra time? Sure, it does. It takes me another probably 15 minutes to do the procedure. I mean, I do it through a deltoid spin incision, but I do all my rotator cuff repairs through a deltoid spin incision because I, there's no morbidity of doing a rotator cuff repair through a deltoid spin incision versus arthroscopically doing it. Just because it's done arthroscopically doesn't mean it's better. So my results on rotator cuff repairs and dermal uh, uh, augmentation 
against any arthroscopic uh, repair, bar none. So that's interesting. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't do a lot of shoulders at all, so I really can't speak to that. So I have, I have another question for you. Where, where else do you see this being applied? I, you know, I, I, I've done one patellar tendon, as I mentioned in this talk. I've done um, perineals, and I do a lot of Achilles. But, you know, as a sports guy, I mean, you, you, you see different parts of the body than I do. Well, have you found it be effective anywhere else, or do you see future applications? I think that's a, a great thing that you did on that case. Uh, say, for example, if you have patellar tendon repairs, I think wrapping the tendon is a great, a new, uh, possibly a new indication for, because really, I mean, because you, you see those patellar tendon tears, I mean, they're just like a, like a horsetail repair. Yes. And so yes. wrapping them, repairing them and wrapping them in the, in the dermal, I, I think it would be a, a, a fantastic augmentation indication. Yeah, that, that and that's sort of that's what I'm getting at. I, um, you know, I I don't obviously I don't see very many. That's why it sort of is is a new, unique case for me. Um, but certainly on call, uh, you know, or if you do a lot of trauma, obviously um, you, you'd see more of that. Um, you know, one initially this was used somewhat for for wound healing, um, and I, I know you don't you don't have as much in the shoulder, but in the total in the total ankle world, when I do an ankle replacement. You know, one of the things they talk about is could you sort of augment wound healing? That is, once I close the extensor retinaculum, can I lay this on top of there and get it to heal? And I, I've never considered that, um, although just, just us sort of shooting the breeze here and, and, and sort of thinking about the ins and outs of it, I think that that's another indication. I, I don't, you know, I don't know how much wound care you do, um, but for me... Well, I, think I don't be... much, but I think that's a, I mean, that's a, it's a great indication for using that, and I'm not a foot and ankle specialist like you are, but... I mean, I would think that if you're doing maybe a lot of ligament reconstructions, maybe you, there's yeah. a lot of indications. You just you, you sometimes have to think outside the box in terms of where where it can be beneficial in terms of improving patient care and improving patient outcomes. And again, as we both have talked about, it's it's all about getting good results. Right. It's all about good because your, our results are our reputation, and people's results are there, and they need to think of it that way. I mean, they need to think about hey. I want my patient off pain medicines. I want them. I want the results to be superior because that is good. Good for you. It's good for your business. It's good for your reputation, and and that means more business. Right. I agree. I agree. This concludes our presentation for today. Hope um, that helped give a better understanding um, of dermal allografts. Thank you for your time and attention.